first of all, I want to thank everybody for joining us. And um, once again, I ask you to bear with us. This is our second Zoom event now, so we should be experts by now, but we're not. Um, but we will become experts since we're going to, the plan is to do three of these calls every week. Uh, we're going to do one on Monday, one on Wednesday, and one on Saturday. Uh, the next one in two days is going to be about the economic uh, impact of the pandemic. And our speakers for that will be um, radio and television presenter Gloria Alvarez and Fox Business um, contributor Jonathan Honig. And then on Saturday, starting this Saturday, every Saturday, we will have a call with Josh Dixon, who is on this call um, about psychology, and we'll see different aspects of uh, how this is affecting our lives and uh, how we can uh, at least mitigate the negative effects uh, of, of everything that's going on. And for today, uh, we have Dr. Andrew Bernstein, author of Heroes, Legends, Champions, Why Heroism Matters. Uh, this, this event was supposed to take place live in London, and then we would also be selling copies of this book, uh, of which we have many, but we will have these events at some point soon, hopefully. Um, so uh, Dr. Bernstein will be uh, presenting some of what he wrote in the book, and Dr. Ashley Frawley is uh, author of Semiotics of Happiness, and a lecturer in uh, Swansea University. Uh, and our chair today will be Nikos Soterokopoulos. So I will pass this on to Nikos, uh, and he will be the, the host of um, the discussion. I'll just say, uh, if you have a question, please use the raise hand function on Zoom, and uh, then Nikos will take questions and comments, and uh, our speakers will answer. Nikos. Right. Right, thanks Razi. So, hi everyone. So, I'm really happy for this event because both of the two speakers would agree on some things. So, both of you, or both of the speakers hold humanism and the idea that human beings are capable of achieving things. They hold it as a high value. So, I would want them, I want them to be on the same panel so we can see some similarities and some differences on how they see a life of meaning and a life of achievement and a life of doing important stuff. And particularly in the days we live in, I think it's important. And I have to say that Andy's book has been a very good companion when everything around is kind of depressive and gloomy. So some, some good kind of dose of heroism, I think is what we need. So well, thank you. Thank you, Nikos. Let's, let's kick it off. So the way it's gonna work, Andy and Ashley have seven to 10 minutes and then we go to the audience. And as Razi said, you can go where it says manage participants. And if you click this, you can see something that says raise hand. And we will, we will go to you in the Q&A. Or alternatively, you can put a question in chat. Priority is usually with people who want to ask live questions. So, Andy. The key thing to me in, in this context is values. And, uh, you know, I'm a long time student of Ayn Rand's philosophy of objectivism and values are always the object of an action. It's something, it's something that we, uh, something that we take at something, somebody, you know, some in our life is enormously important. We take action to gain or, or to keep the, the value. So, for, you know, for example, somebody, somebody wants an education and they work hard, you know, in, in school to get, to get the education or somebody wants to rear a family of healthy, happy children, you know, they put a lot of effort into, into child rearing and, and so on and so forth. So your know, values are always the object of an action, that, that which we act to gain and or keep. And your know, values are the, the difference maker in human life. They're the, they're the meaning maker in, in human life. You know, there's very religious people who think that in order to have meaning in life, you have to fit into a, a, a divine plan. And I as a devout atheist, you know, I, re I reject that. And I reject the idea that without a, a divine plan, that there's, there's no meaning in, in life. I, again, values are the meaning makers. So for me, for example, from the time I was a little kid, I always knew I wanted to be a writer, especially of fiction, but, but also of nonfiction. It adds enormous meaning uh, to my life. You know, when you can look at, at, uh, at different peoples, whether it's romantic love, 
you know, that, that they want with, with some partner that they love and can trust and who loves and trusts them, or it's a family of, of healthy children, or it's a career in the field of computer science or whatever. Values are that which, add, that I like to think of them as the meaning maker. They add, they add enormous, val, uh, enormous meaning to our, our life, both in the pursuit of them and the achievement of them, you know, the journey to the destination and the destination combined adds tremendous meaning uh, to a person's life. And so, you know, I'm all, I'm all about supporting people's quest for values. Now, the values, of course, and I think Ayn Rand is brilliant on this. She showed that, you know, the values, legitimate values promote human life. You know, whether, you know, whether, whether you're uh, an, an English professor or whether, you know, you, you're a loving husband or wife or a loving parent, values promote, you know, values promote human life. It's, it, values are not anything a person happens to feel. You know, uh, drugs are not, you know, uh, heroin, for, for example, is not a value to the heroin addict, although he or she may feel that it is. Val so I think there are two criteria for legitimate values. One, they objectively promote human life, giving human nature their life supporting uh, and, and, and life, ad life advancing. Uh, and two, they're passionately held and loved by an individual. You meet those two criteria and you fill your life with objective, rational, life-promoting values. And this is the route to happiness. This is the route to what Aristotle you know, referred to as eudaimonia, or flourishing life. Now, regarding heroes, uh, heroes are always valuers. They, 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 something that they love, whether it's their life, or the life of the people they love, or you know, take some fictitious examples, you know, like Hector in the Iliad, the the, the existence of this of Troy, you know, the city and the people he loves are threatened by your ancestors, Nikos, uh, by the Greeks. But we forgive you because uh, the you know the Greeks gave us so so many so many gifts. But but anyhow, and you're not responsible for what your ancestors did anyhow. But anyhow, uh, so you know, Hector loves. His city loves his people, his wife, his, his children, his, you know, his parents, and he fights to the death you know, to, defend, to, def to defend them. A hero stands up for values, whether, whether something that's precious to him or her is threat. Your family, your life, your mind, you know, your business, your wealth, your, your, your country. You stand up for, for the values uh, that, that you believe. And this is why you know, the conventional view that heroism involves self-sacrifice is uh, profoundly and egregiously mistaken. Uh, heroes, cowards, sacrifice what's their, their values. They won't, they won't stand up for them, you know, un, under pressure. But uh, a hero will always stand up uh, for his or her values. And, and if you lose your life in, in support of that, that's, that is a heroic deed, but it's not self-sacrifice. It is, a, a, and again, Ayn Rand is brilliant on, on this, on what a sacrifice is. It's, it's surrendering a higher value for a lesser value or a, or a non-value. And I think, you know, to, to surrender the values that make life meaningful is a sacrifice. But if you lose your life in defense of the values that make life meaningful, that's not, I don't think that's a sacrifice. That's a, that's a, that is a value-laden, value-driven, value-advancing action. You know, my ex-wife, uh, put it very nicely about our daughter, you know, who's now 17. She said to me, you know, when Penny was a little girl, she said, I, I throw myself in front of a bus for her. And I don't think that was hyperbole. I mean, I think she, you know, she, she meant it literally. And I, I know normally that would be construed as a parent dies in uh, protecting the life of his or her child. Normally that would be construed as, as a sacrifice. I utterly reject that. I mean, that, that again, a, a, a sacrifice is to, is to surrender a, a higher value for a lesser value. That is a value-driven action. She would be protecting probably the highest value, the acne or the, the apex of, of values in, in her life. She's going to risk her life uh, and even, even to give her life to, uh, to protect the person that is of the, of the utmost importance. So I think, I think the, the, the question, let me wrap this up. I think the question of, of happiness and heroes both revolve around the issue of, of, of values. 
And happiness is uh, necessarily dependent on the pursuit and achievement of values. And that's exactly what heroes do. They, their values in some form are threatened and they stand up uh, for that which gives life, gives their life meaning. So I can, I, let me, let me uh, wrap it up right there. Thanks, thanks, Adi. And this is very interesting because one of my favorite heroes in history, Leonidas, in the eyes of everyone in Thermopylae, when with his 300 and some other Greeks stood against hundreds of thousands, he's been considered a universal symbol of sacrifice. But according to your view, he's not sacrificing because he prefers to die than to live under shame or slavery from the, from the person. So that's a very interesting, very interesting point. Right. And the same thing with the mother or father who loses their life in protecting their child. They prefer to die rather than live in the world without the child. And yeah. I, I, as, as a father, I got to understand that. That makes sense to me. That makes sense. That's a good point. All right. Let's go to Ashley. Yeah, so I have uh, the other good thing about uh, doing this from home is that I can do this with a beer. <laughs> so small joie de vivre. Okay, so I would actually agree that um, happiness is dependent on values, but I mean that in a fundamentally different way. I mean it in the sense that both are social relations. Um, so there's no point in talking about eternal human values or eternal human nature or the human needs that are required for eudaimonia or flourishing or whatever because what is required for that for human beings to flourish today is different than what was required a thousand years ago is different than what will be required in 200 years um, because these things arise out of the organization of society so i think actually yes the value is the central concept of our times but not in an abstract quasi-psychological way. I mean, economic value is the, uh, the central unit of our times that we need to understand if we are to understand um, the forces of history, um, how uh, society and human beings um, act in a dialectical or, or um, like a dialogue with each other and change over time. Um, so, um, you can talk about change. This is very common in our, in our culture now. You can talk about changing people's values. We really need to go in and change values and change behaviors because we're, we're so convinced that it's ultimately human beings that are to blame. Something goes wrong, it's got to be us. What are you doing wrong? How are you feeling? How are you acting? How are you behaving that's mistaken? And we never, I mean, never think, well, how is that behavior actually potentially logical within the context of that situation um, and i think that in order to do that we need to understand the deeper structures of society we're not just sort of floating around in the abstract <clears throat> choosing our values choosing to live exactly as we please um, so for example i'm free um, you know, freer than a, uh, a peasant would be, freer than a slave would be, but in some important ways i'm not fully free the first thing that i have to do is i have to get a job Right. And I think my life would be very, very different if I didn't have to do that. If there was some, if we could think about um, if machines were like, uh, like trees, we could just sort of go out and get what you need from a factory, you know, that's fully automated or something like that. Uh, and my basic needs were fully provided for what I would do with my life would be fundamentally different <laughs> um, if I didn't have to worry about a certain amount of scarcity. And in fact, a certain amount of scarcity that is more or less, um, artificial as well. Um, so we need to understand these underlying economic relationships in order to understand fully um, human beings. If we want to understand human freedom or human flourishing, we have to understand the economic base of society because that puts limits on what is possible, on the, on the certain amount of freedom that is possible. Um, so we can sit there and talk about values all we want, but at the end of the day, I have to sell my labor, my labor power to a capitalist, my ability to work to a capitalist. I'm not free to not do that. If I'm part of the vast majority of the population of the world, I'm not free to not do that. That's, that is a coercion. That is a, a primary coercion that I have to do. Um, I have to make a living. Um, and, uh, if I'm a capitalist, I'm also not fully free to just choose whatever values I want. Like, oh, do you know what? I don't really want to follow the profit motive. I really care about the environment, so I'm not going to make a profit. Forget about it. Um, I'm just going to, you know, be inefficient and uh, and try to be uh, work in harmony with nature and pay my workers as much as I want and so on. 
and then you go out of business. So the profit motive exerts a powerful force on, on your behavior. Um, and therefore, although you might be a nice person, although you might, you know, want to meditate and think that, you know, money is real bad and makes you a bad person and really hate that you have to do it. At the end of the day, you have to do it. There's something powerful that pushes us um, and that we need to understand if we're going to rationally um, direct the forces of history, we must understand them. And understanding them requires that we understand them historically, their emergence, how, the, how um, economic laws function, before we can sit here and talk about pie in the sky ideas about human happiness and human values, because these are always going to change. I think, so you mentioned Aristotle, and I find it very interesting that there's been a penchant for Aristotle over the last 20 years. Why Aristotle? Why is Aristotle's idea of happiness always thrown out? Now you have your own ideas based on Ayn Rand, but other people have their own ideas. It's um, and and it's become this like, uh, you know, we should teach Aristotle in schools. <laughs> and if only we could, uh, uh, you know, operate our businesses. I remember when I was writing my book, I came across this um, quote where it was like this uh, capitalist basically was um, bragging about being able to keep his wages um, in China down to three quarters of London levels by operating on the, on uh on um, the idea of gross national happiness and like encouraging happiness over money and that kind of thing. Um, and, but anyway, so why is Aristotle so, so powerful? Because I think it's a very static idea of human uh, flourishing. It basically says that there's something within you um, or uh, something within you that you must live in accordance with um, to, you know, to flourish. Um, it's like, you know, the, um, the seed contains the tree that it will become. It's never going to be anything other than a tree. But human beings are different than that. Um, I think that we should look not at Aristotle, but Heraclitus, um, and think about this idea of unending improvement, that it's not just that human beings are seeds that will grow into something, we live in accordance with our true nature, or whatever. It's human subjectivity is much more open. It changes depending on our time period. Um, and therefore, and that is really, really important because if there is a static human nature, then what we see is simply the outcome of human nature. There's no point in trying to change things because human nature will simply reassert itself. Um, but of course, then that leaves out why throughout human history, there have been so many different ways of organizing society, why around the world currently, there are so many different ways of organizing society, cross-culturally and so on, why people react in such fundamentally different ways to their circumstances. Um, so we have to have an idea, and, and I think the important thing uh, about the Enlightenment was this idea not of um, flourishing as something that is self-contained, um, but uh, in some Enlightenment thinkers, this idea of unending improvement, you know, in Hegel's uh, idea of, of human progress is this sort of open kind of subjectivity. As subjectivity is something that changes over time, what it means to be human changes, and of course that was taken up by Karl Marx, um, because an open idea of what it means to be human means an open future. If we can rationally understand um, the forces of history, then we can direct them to our conscious will, and we can uh, remove the barriers to human freedom. And those barriers are not in human nature, but are outside of human nature and are in society, and therefore we can have control over them. But if it's just human nature, then this is simply a reflection of human nature, and there's no point in trying to change things. Um, so I think that value actually is one of the most important concepts of our time, but I think we need to understand it in terms of economic value. We have to understand it in terms of historical value, that is its historical emergence, um, in order to understand the underlying forces that drive history and that shape human subjectivity. Thank you, Ashley. So last April, oh, me, hundreds of thousands of people even paid money for the Zizek Peterson debate, and we never had this debate about Marxism and capitalism and happiness, but actually we're having it today. So basically Razi is giving you a better value mm. than this uh, well-advertised event with Zizek and Peterson. So uh, I'm gonna go to the audience in a second, but since there was this apparent disagreement among the panel, can I give just no more than one to two minutes, if possible, for Andy to have a comeback and then us to have a comeback. But this round, I don't want it to last more than five minutes. So I want you to have two minutes each, no more than two minutes, please. 
Andy. Thank you, Nikos. I think we need a definition of freedom. And I, I think that, you know, freedom uh, in, a, in a political, and we're not talking in a metaphysical context about free will, in a political context, it means you know, the absence of the initiation of force against me or the protection that I'm protected uh, against the initiation of force. And this is why we need, you know, the principle of individual rights. So we need a government of let's say fair capitalism. This is, this is, this is, this is what in, institutes and, and protects uh, the, the principle of, uh, of individual rights. And so when, when, my, when my rights are protected, then I, then I am free to choose my values. The fact that I have to work productively is a fact of nature. It's not imposed on me by society. It's imposed on me by nature. We don't live in a garden of Eden. We have to grow food, build houses, cure diseases. And when it, within that context, I am 100% I am free to, to choose the values that I love. So I knew from the time I was a child, I wanted to be a writer. And, I, and I'm a writer. And if I, you know, if I, if I wanted to be you know, in a free country, if I wanted to be a bricklayer or a painter or a, a nurse or whatever, I would choose that and, uh, and, and pursue it. I knew I wanted romantic love. I, I knew I, you know, I, I, I had to be the kind of, the kind of man you know, who could uh, attract the kind of woman I wanted, worked at that, I wanted to be a better, better father to my daughter. You know, I, I worked at that. So within, within a, a free society where the principle of individual rights is upheld, where you have a, we have a system of laissez-faire capitalism, political freedom exists. I choose what I want to do as, you, as long as I do not initiate force or fraud against innocent victims. The government must uphold and protect my right uh, to live my life as I choose. I'm not influenced. I, uh, you know, I, the society may want me to do certain things, be religious or whatever. My, my parents may want me to do certain things, not, not marry this woman and, you know, marry somebody else. You know, I use my own judgment. I rejected society in that regard. I rejected my parents in that regard. And I live an independent life, you know, uh, living, living in accordance with my own judgment. And this is the way, this is the way to flourish. There is such a thing as human nature. It has not changed from Aristotle's day to ours. Aristotle is right. Man is the rational animal. We're an animal of a certain kind, undeniable fact. We have the, the, what fundamentally distinguishes us from lions and tigers and bears. Oh my, is our ability to think, our critical, uh, critical ability. You almost sound like a Marxist though. There are a couple and, of ones that are almost exactly wait, 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 wait. Marx. You don't have to be insulting, Ashley. No, and um, it's true and, you know, we, and we live and we li live in accordance with our rational faculty you know thinking uh th thinking logically not just acting on our impulses we don't have to we don't have to live like bill clinton you know we can we can control out we, 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 we no we feel whatever we feel i get that but we don't have to act in accordance with what we feel we can act in, in accordance with our rational judgment especially regarding moral principles so that's you know, that's uh, that's enough for right now. Thanks. So us. Yeah, uh, there's a lot in there that I agreed with, um, except that I don't think this is the end of history. And I think that um, so if you want to have a definition of freedom, I also have a definition of freedom that's negative freedom. Um, that I want to remove barriers to individual. Um, freedom that I don't want to stipulate what it is in advance. I don't want to tell people what they have to do. Um, and I think in order to do that, we have to move beyond this particular system, which does coerce me. Um, if I choose, if I choose not to work, I will starve or I have to go and live off of someone who does work. Um, those are my options. I can become a capitalist. I can become a worker or I can live off of somebody who is one of those things. I, I can't, I, I can't just go out into the world and do whatever I want. I'm going to, I'm free to do whatever I want. So long as a capitalist will pay me for it, I can become a singer or, uh, and I can be very, very good at it. But if a capitalist isn't going to pay me to do it, then I'm not going to become a singer or an artist or something like that. Um, I'm just going to be poor. Um, and so uh, I don't think that we can shoehorn in capitalism as the protectorate of rights because capitalism is a dynamic system. It's ever changing. Um, so I don't define capitalism in um, 
an ideal sense, I define capitalism in a material sense, and that is its self-expanding value. Its purpose is simply to expand itself, and in doing that, um, one of the ways that it uh, one of the ways that it functions is by pushing human beings out of the labor process. Now, regardless of what I want for myself and my family, if it comes down to me or profit. I can go F myself, basically. Um, and how is that for my freedom, right? My freedom to do, to do what I want to do, to keep working, to do a job that I love, um, is severely undermined by the fact that there is a, uh, a system that I do not control, that act, or that I could po possibly control if I had a rational understanding of it and I grouped together with other people with a similar rational understanding. Um, but it... it exerts a force on me that appears to be quite alien. Um, I, we are sort of thrown about by forces that appear to be beyond our control. Economic crises, war, all of these things, uh, they're like, they appear like acts of God, as though they're completely alienated from human ends, and yet they are the product of human activity. Um, and they are things that if we could understand rationally, we might be able to overcome. So my, uh, so I'm kind of a funny Marxist in the sense that I don't have, a, well, I don't think that this is, should be funny as a Marxist, but I don't have a blueprint that I want to impose on the world because that is uh, a, that is a very dangerous thing to do, but also, um, it has the potential to remove people's freedoms in service of my big, uh, you know, project that I want to do, uh, you know, and like make everybody philosophers or something like that. You know, people will say that sort of thing. I think people shouldn't be too consumerist. I want everyone to be a philosopher. Well, I don't care what you want everyone to be. I want people to be what they want to be. And I want to remove the barriers that capitalism puts up to that um, at a certain point. You know, capitalism is a wonderful system. It has absolutely overcome a huge amount of the problems that existed in feudalism um, and in, in slave states and so on. It gives us an enormous amount of freedom. We are not fully free. We are not there yet. In order to be fully free, we must get rid of scarcity. And wonderfully, capitalism does that. It does that every day. And yet, by doing that, it undermines the basis of its own existence. Um, and therefore, and, and what winds up happening is that this system that creates extraordinary abundance, which should provide the basis for human freedom, a certain amount of material security that would then allow us to live and act in the ways that we want to, gets destroyed <laughs> every 10, 15 years in a crisis that is completely artificial, that throws people out of work, that, that acts upon them in, in ways that deny, denies them of their freedom because they cannot, um, they appear to be thrown about by these forces beyond their control. That is a, I want to remove that so that we can be free so that we can use this basis of wealth and abundance that capitalism creates to actually be free thanks Ashley so uh, shall we take one person okay let's see how many questions we have and we'll see how we take them so we have some things in the comment Joseph says that uh, profit is basically inherent in production so we produce food clothes and stuff so that's how people get profit. But let's go to the question. So we have Antoine and then we have Amy. Let's do it a bit like bundle of ideas. So we take a couple of questions and then the panel decides how they address them. Antoine. Um, I have two questions. It's mainly about definitions because I think you're disagreeing on definitions quite a bit. Um, first in the realm of metaphysics and then politics. So first, first of all, um, I wondered if you could um, e either, um, e either of you, probably both of you, define exactly what you mean by human nature, because it seems that um, Dr. Bernstein agrees that uh, you can actually have a human nature and have free will at the same time. Um, probably because in that sense, human nature is just what you need to live as a human, but then you can choose to follow that or not. And then if afterwards, Dr. Frawley can describe what she means exactly by human nature, because it seems to disagree. And you, and you think that when you have a human nature, you don't actually have free will. And every, if, if there is human nature, then everything ends up during to one particular end. And then regarding um, the politics, I wondered if you could both define what you mean by coercion and exactly what it involves. Because it, it seems that the, both of you disagree of, of about whether there is coercion in capitalism or, or how exactly it comes about and how good or bad that coercion may be. 
And because it, it's, I'm, I'm guessing, again, yeah, Dr. Bernstein would say that there, would, there is no uh, bad coercion within capitalism. And obviously, I understand that uh, Dr. Foley uh, thing is the contrary. So I wondered if you could explain exactly what you mean by coercion and where it comes in. And possibly, if Dr. Foley can uh, give an alternative to current capitalism in order to make things better, I would also appreciate it. Thank you. Right. Let's also take Amy. So my questions, my two questions were basically exactly the same as Antoine's. Great minds think alike, don't they? Yeah. Um, so maybe I'll try to phrase one of them slightly differently. So I thought that in Dr. Ashley's um, speech that there was this implication that a static human nature, I think that's the sort of um, way you phrased it, a static human nature implies some um, that you would observe a, you know, I think you use the words end of history or non change, you know, values change over time, what were values in the past and not values now. Mm -hmm. So there was something about a, if there was such a thing as a static human nature, that it would imply that we wouldn't see values changing over time. Um, so that, that's my question. Thanks. Okay, so let's go back to the panel and then we go for another round of questions. Okay, so um, to I think the first question was about um, defining, was that right? Um, um, so, oh, uh, where does profit come from? So obviously from a Marxist perspective, profit comes from um, workers uh, producing more value than they are paid in their wages. So their wages go to, you know, they're paid the value of, of their labor in the sense that um, what is the going rate to keep that person showing up to work the next day. But when the value of human labor is that it produces, the additional use value of human labor is that it produces more value than uh, you pay for it. So you put somebody on a production line and obviously if they get paid more than they produce, they'll get fired. Um, so obviously that is my understanding of profit. Um, it is a fundamentally dynamic understanding of capitalism that um, it is that capitalism was a, is a progressive system. It, it, it overcame uh, a lot of the issues of, of previous systems. It uh, gives us a certain amount more freedom than existed in the past. You know, you are not born a slave to die a slave, born a peasant to die a peasant. Um, you are free to sell your labor, your ability to work to anyone who will buy it. Uh, I want a world in which you are just free to do what you want, <laughs> to uh, talk philosophy in the evening, to fish in the morning, and all of that stuff, as the famous line goes. Um, so about human nature, um, I have a more, much more optimistic view of human na nature. I think when people say, oh, it's just human nature, it's, it's similar to saying, like, it's God's will. <laughs> the, in the, like you take the conversation to some sort of logical end and they go well it's human nature well it's god's will basically um i have a much more optimistic and open understanding of human nature um you had said um that it's this it's it's part of nature that we have to work on the world absolutely Karl marx said that he said it's the everlasting nature and post condition that man must work on the world and in so doing he works on himself we change ourselves because we're able to do things in the world. Our conscious human activity in the world changes the world. And then we have different possibilities open to us. And we have different possibilities open to us. We become different. We become different as human beings. I think obviously coming from a background in anthropology, um, I, the idea that there's some kind of static way of, uh, of being human is totally alien to me because, you know, what did I study as an undergraduate degree? All the many humongous varieties of human experience and the ways that human beings respond to and cope with particular situations, even the way that we become ill is different. Like how we become psychologically ill is different in different cultures. There are, um, uh, what are called um, culture bound syndromes, for example, where, um, you know, people become psychologically unwell in totally different ways around the world. Um, and when you're in that culture, it just seems normal and natural to you. But then you go to another culture and they go, no, nope, that's weird. We don't have that. <laughs> um, so there are lots of these kinds of examples. So um, I think that um, our ability to work on the world means that we create different economic systems. Those economic systems condition what appears to be possible, what appears natural and normal, and everyone. So if you go back to feudalism, 
people said it is the nature of the surf to be a surf it is the nature of the landowner to be a landowner that's just the way it is it's just human nature it's God's will. And we have the same sort of idea today. It is natural for the workers to be workers and for the capitalists to be capitalists. It is God's will. I mean, human nature. Um, so I think human nature is intimately tied to the economic system and the possibilities that, are, that exist due to that particular economic system. I think capitalism has made us, made it possible for us to be individuals in ways that was never available to us in the past. We're not fully free. And, I, and capitalism is creating something else every day, which leads into the question about what would I put an alternative to capitalism. It's not like, um, you know, capitalism's all right, but it's got these problems and I've got this wonderful idea. Let's just like throw the whole thing out and put up a new idea. That's crazy. That is crazy. The, like, and the, I find that nuts when people will say things like, oh, you know, capitalism causes mental illness. That's why it has to be overcome. That is disproportionate to an insane degree. If the main problem with capitalism is that it makes us discontent, then give people drugs. Like, don't overthrow the entire economic system. The, the reason why I think that capitalism has to be overcome is because it is overcoming itself through its mate through its self expansion through the way that it makes profit it actually undermines its ability to make future profit um, and so we stop investing in productive activity which is the great thing about capitalism and uh, why like why bother um, when there's so much risk involved just throw your money into a bubble make bigger and bigger bubbles and then have them burst every 10 years and say no I didn't do it you did it you did it, you know and, and pass the blame around I think that what we have to do is understand what capitalism is and those little bits of freedom that we can see that are being created this this world of wealth that's just beyond the horizon where we can kind of see like look there's so much abundance in the world there are these enormous mcmansions and houses that go up so quickly and yet nobody lives in them while people go homeless and we can say like gosh i can kind of imagine a world in which everybody has a house that's it's possible, it's there, but I, we have not figured out how to do it. That's no small thing. Throughout the 20th century, we have tried to overcome what's called the law of value, the way that profit is made in capitalism, and we have failed miserably. But I think it's an important question. It's the question of our times, because where capitalism is taking us is either toward like I can well imagine in order to restore profit rates, you know, massive devaluation that is, you know, fat, people thrown out of work, factories laying idle, um, uh, massive consolidation of, of capital, possibly war, you know, that's a really good way to devalue lots of, of, of capital, just literally blow it up and then build it again. Wonderful. Boom. For 20 years. <laughs> that's terrifying. And it's, it's completely unnecessary. We, we have to figure out find out what are those little, th the, these things that capitalism is creating every day that leads us forward into a future in which we truly do have that freedom, where that abundance actually is unleashed, not to expand itself, but for the freedom of human beings, to enable the right. freedom of human beings. I like that it's possible it's your slide because it's also mentioned by a hero in Atlas Rack, who is not to be mentioned because then it's a, it's a spoiler. So, Andy, by the way, Antoine, have you got and that? I, and I, you know, I love, I love the bits. And I, when I read Atlas Shrugged, you know, the, the romantic anti-capitalist pissed me off just as much as I pissed off Rand. I hate <laughs> this idea of like, oh, we should all be equal, hold back progress. No, I want, I'm so progressive that I think capitalism is holding us back. Right. Andy. All right. The, uh, the first question I think was regarded human nature and, and free will. And I think, first of all, I want to point out we're, we're, we're discussing metaphysics right now. And, you know, if you look at the, if you look at the world, everything has a nature, including human beings. You know, uh, a car is car, or an apple is, is apple, and you know, pen is pen, and pen is not non-pen. Everything has a nature. Nothing's exempt from the law of identity. A is A, as uh, Aristotle students in the Middle Ages put it. And man is man. A human being is human being. And, you, you know, biologically, we are the same being we were during the, during the times of Greek philosophy over, over 2,000 years ago. There's certain, there's certain things we need, we need to do with the certain foods we need to eat that will, uh, we need enough protein. We, we need to get vitamins and minerals, you know, from the, from the vegetables, our 
biological system and our digestive system is is the same. We need to, you know, we need to learn how to grow crops. We need to learn how to cure diseases. We need to learn how to educate children. You know, we, we, we need to apply our rational faculty to the problems that, that nature uh, pose for us. Man is man or human being is human being just as much as cat is cat and dog is dog. And that doesn't change. That's not going to change. Now, free will is part of, of human nature. We are a, a volitional being. Our rational faculty gives us the capacity to understand the alternatives presented to us in the environment and to choose one over the other. Uh, if, we, if we go by observational evidence, it's very easy to, to prove the reality of free will. It's, intro, it's, it, it's introspectively self-evident. We can introspect, uh, turn mental attention on mental processes, and uh, be aware of ourselves in the act of choosing between alternatives. Whether it's a simple thing like, what do I do after, after we're done this evening? Will I go out to, to uh, eat? Will I eat at home? Will I call my daughter? Uh, I, can, I can be aware of myself, you know, my mental processes in the very act of, of choosing, and including on much more momentous decisions. Will I propose to Nancy or will I not propose to Nancy? What's the next book I want to write? Is I want to do I write? I want to write another novel next or the book on the nature of evil that I intend that I intend to write. And I can, you know, I can be aware of myself in the act of, of um, uh, making a judgment and choosing amongst all alternatives. So volition is part of human nature. That's, uh, that's part of being the, the, the rational animal. And it's, 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 a, it's a causal factor. It's just like, uh, you know, the, if the wind blows and, you know, and blows some ice down the street, the wind is the cause of the ice moving. But for human beings, the choices we make, if, if I choose to go out and get dinner after, after, after we're done this evening, then you know, that's, the, that's the causal agent, my own, my own uh, choice here, that propels me uh, into action. So human nature is real, just like everything, everything else has a nature. It doesn't change, and free will is part of it. Now, uh, coercion is, uh, is a human activity. I think we're, now we're in the field of moral philosophy. And when human beings initiate force or fraud against an innocent victim, that's the, that's the imposition of, co of coercion. I don't think nature coerces us. I disagree with Dr. Frawley on this. The fact that we have to work is not a social imposition. I think nature coerces it's, us, it's, it's, although it's, it does coerce not, us. Not, Wait, these two people speak, we can't hear either. Sorry. If that's, that's not a social imposition, not in a free society. I mean, if, if slave drivers, you know, force me to work for them, that's a, another matter. But I'm talking about in, in, a, in a free society, I have to work, I have to be productive. That's a stipulation of nature. It's not a stipulation of other human beings. It's not, it's not coercion. The, the, that, that reality demands human beings be productive, that we don't live in the Garden of Eden, that we need to produce the values life requires is not a restriction on my freedom. Uh, and again, like I said before, I need to be productive, but as Butcher Baker Candlestick Maker, you know, I choose the field that I love to be productive in. Now, of course, the field that I love, I agree with Dr. Foley on this, the field that I love may not be very profitable. You know, so so if I'm if I'm writing a you know, book on the uh, very philosophic book on the nature of heroism, I think the book's really good, but you know, the, the, it's very philosophical. The readers, you know, there may not be a wide market for it. So I may, you know, I teach philosophy, I, you know, I, I lecture. And I'm, I'm not going to get rich that way. Uh, my daughter's going to have to go to you know to a school that's that's affordable uh, uh, for us. But the but. And, and money and material comforts are, you know, are, are a great thing. You know, I, I, I'd like to live in a, in a mansion and drive a, you know, drive a Mercedes and, you know, and send Penny to Princeton, you know, and, and everything. Can't afford to do that. But nevertheless, uh, first of all, the, the material level of comforts, and, and, and I agree with Dr. Frawley on this too, that capitalism has provided us simply beyond uh, anything of pre-capitalist systems, uh, could create it by whole orders of magnitude. So even on, on my philosophy professors, uh, you know, I have I have central air, you know, in my apartment. I have I have a I, I drive a, a Honda, which I'm very happy with, by the way. Uh, not, not a Mercedes, <laughs> you know. So I shop, you know, I, I shop at at Target, you know, not at uh, 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 Bloomingdale's or you know or or, or whatever. But um, 
But I have all of these things. They're just a, of, of, a, of a, a lesser, somewhat lesser quality. And I'm happy with them, mostly because I have the time to do what I really love. And that is write books, spend time with my daughter, you know, spend time with my friends, and so on and so on. So again, I want to I stress, uh, the greatest thing about capitalism, and I mean real capitalism, less say fair capitalism, so not the mixed economy welfare states that we see all over the world, including in the, in the United States, are the, is, the, is the principle of individual rights. Ayn Rand defined capitalism as the system of individual rights, and that's exactly, it's exactly, unfortunately, it's been abrogated, it doesn't exist anywhere in the world. The closest to it, ironically, may have been Hong Kong, but now, you know, you have the communists uh, imposing their will on the, you know, on a relatively free society. But, um, so, the principle of individual rights is what I'm concerned to uphold. The proper name for this system, by the way, is liberalism, right? The system of liberty. And I'm a liberal. I am an absolute liberal. The, the system of liberty, the system of individual rights in which the initiation of force is legally banned and uh, can be used only in retaliation against those uh, who initiated it. And by the way, my teacher, one of my teachers, Dr. Leonard Peikoff, who was Ayn Rand's uh, student, you know, I, once, I, I agree with him like, absolutely. He, somebody once asked him in a question and answer period, if you could do one, if you had the power to do one single thing uh, that would improve human life on this earth, what would you do? And Dr. Peikoff immediately answered, ban the initiation of force. And I agree with him. Ban the initiation of force morally across the board uh, by, by human beings uh, against each other. And then one, we're free to deal with nature rationally, you know, learning how to grow crops and cure diseases and so on without anybody, private individuals or governments, uh, initiating force against us. And two, we're free, to, we're, we're free then to work socially, uh, to, to be rational socially with our brothers and, and sisters and nobody's going to initiate force. And if we, if we can't come to any kind of negotiated settlement, we simply agree to disagree. And we don't invade and conquer Poland, you know, because we, uh, <laughs> because we don't, you know, we, we, we don't agree. So I think the, to wrap this up, the alternative, I think, to what we have now is less I fit. There's, there's a lot of people around the world, including in the United States, who seem to still think that, you know, the United States is a capitalist system. Now, that's, that's just false. It hasn't been uh, since the progressive year or 100 years ago, and it's gotten progressively or regressively less capitalist, you know, as you go through the New Deal, you know, and, 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 and so on and so forth. And the, there's any number of examples I could give of the socialist elements in, in American society that are harmful. The, the, the medical system, for example, is one. But the, the most egregious example of how the socialist elements in the American system uh, undermine the quest for human fulfillment is the goddamn educational system. The, the public school system simply sucks. It wasn't good when I was a kid. It's gotten much worse since. My students, in many cases, these are good kids, they're college kids. Some cases, they struggle just with the mechanics of reading. They certainly struggle with reading comprehension. If I want them to read Descartes or Kant or, you know, or, or Locke or Hobbes or whoever it is, they, they, there's only a handful of students in any class who can actually read primary sources. It's very difficult to do real uh, college philosophy. It's painful to watch these poor kids struggle in my logic classes because they never learned any, any grammar. These are good kids. They can't write a coherent sentence. They don't know the first thing about history. They don't know the first thing about American history. Uh, and if we desperately need to privatize the school system. Now, that's not a universal panacea, but that would be a huge step in the right directions because most parents want their kids to learn how to read or write and do arithmetic, you know, funny Funny thing, that the schools, the schools that would that would get the most uh, 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 customers are the schools that excel at teaching the kids how to how to read, write, and, and cognitive basics. The and let's put a comma the, here. The, the, public here. System, the public school system must be abolished. I'm I agree. Kidding. But let's go to the next question. which comes from William, and it's a. I have it's so a, much to say to that. Oh, don't, don't just. Well, <laughs> we have to, we have to give value to our audience. Yes. Well. Okay. Sorry. You have you 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 will all have a final word. So, mm. we so William asked an interesting question. So, Ashley talked about that we live in a world of abundance, and this means that we should make more of it, basically. So William, I asked, we should, we are, we just are. Yeah. So William asked, how would we recognize a world that had enough superabundance to allow people to be free in Ashley's definition? Because if we think it this way, so 
Marxists who had a good understanding already, let's say, from the 19th century said that we live in a world of abundance compared yeah. to everything before. So when is actually the time to go beyond? Was the time then? Because if the time was then, then we wouldn't have, I don't know, airplanes, spaceships, whatever. Oh, of might. course, you would say that we might be having flying cars, but whatever. So the question is, when do we know, based on Ashley's premises, that now we have reached this level of abundance, which means that we can go beyond? And if it's okay, I will focus on Ashley on this question, because it's a question focused on Ashley. But if so you, you just want me to answer that one question? Yes, and then we'll go to, to our audience again. Well, I wanted, I'm just going to slip in that Engels once wrote to Marx that um, uh, egoists like Max Stirner were bound to become communists out of sheer egoism. Anyways, okay, so um, how would we recognize the world of superabundance? Uh, I think when the crises become deeper and deeper and the destruction becomes more and more obvious, a world of wealth and culture and possibility that stands in stark contrast to the huge number of people that are left out of it. Um, and that's what capitalism does. It spits out people at the end of the day. Um, people, we, we create this um, enormous surplus population. And by a surplus, I don't mean like, obviously literally useless people it's impossible every human being is uh you know hands that can work and mind a mind that can think um but you know spits these people out and sees them as useless at least in terms of um the perpetuation of of capital um uh, and people will not accept that i hope anyway um that the more there's destruction the more people get spat out the system the more we realize that this system is not the end it, um that there the capitalism is creating something else every day um but i don't think it will create that inevitably i think that we will have huge destruction huge capital destruction long before you know before we realize that um what it is <laughs> we figure out whatever that mechanism is that we've not as humanity we've not figured it out yet we have not figured out a way to solve the uh calculation problem we've not figured out how to distribute things without the market but the market comes with contradictions the market comes with problems um that are not external to it but uh, arise from its very proper functioning um like you have to ask yourself why do you say like, oh, capitalism doesn't exist. So you sit there getting pissed off at reality for not living up to your definitions um, instead of understanding why reality is taking that position, that, that direction, because people are rational. They're working on the world and they're trying to solve problems. Um, and when they do that, you see these broader global trends and that gives us a clue as to what people are trying to do to overcome those contradictions. Um, so for example, in most developed economies, people are, it's like more and more distribution is happening through the state. As it happens, I don't actually think that is a good thing. Um, but that is what is happening because there's some contradiction, some problem that is being worked out in reality. You have to understand that instead of saying, oh, that's not real capitalism. You know, Marxists do the exact same thing. Well, you know, socialism failed. And we're like, oh, that wasn't real socialism. Well, you're doing the exact same thing. You just go, oh, that wasn't real capitalism or social, you know, capitalism. Um, well, we have to understand why, like even like me as a Marxist, I think that's really, really important. Why did the USSR fail so miserably? Um, we have to understand that in order to move forward because I think it is extremely important. It is more, it is inevitable that we will come to this question. How do we unleash that superabundance for the purposes of human freedom? Thank you. Uh, right. So we have two very good questions in the audience, sorry, in the, in the chat. But Antoine has also a question, so I'll go to Antoine. Actually, I'll take Antoine. I'll take one from the chat. You answer, and then we have an excellent coronavirus question by Alejandro, so then we'll get to that. So, Antoine. Thank you. Um, two questions, one per, per speaker. One for Dr. Bernstein. I wondered if you could um respond to the criticism of capitalism based on the different economic crises that happen every eight years essentially for example i mean the, the subprimes or I, I know you're not an economics ex expert but I'm, I'm maybe some people are in the audience if you could explain uh, what your point of view on this is if it is a proof of capitalism going wrong or proof of it not being real capitalism or mm -hmm. what it is for you because it, it seems like a very 
real criticism. People lost a lot of their livelihoods and people, people died, a lot of people died because of these crises and had their lives destroyed. So clearly it's, it's a horrible thing. And I'm, I'm sure you agree that this crisis was a horrible thing for many people. So it, in other words, how does it, this fit within a, a defense of capitalism? And um, to Dr. Frawley, you, you finished by talking about uh, creating a system for the purpose of people's free, uh, someone's freedom. And I wanted to, you to expand on whose freedom and who the system should be for, essentially. Should everyone um, in, in your system become the hero and, and the happy person, um, regardless of how, how much it, what work they put in it, or like by what standard and who exactly should be the um, the target of this perfect system. Good. And actually, I can't really fit it in with the other question. So let's go. Let's answer this question. Let's try to be relatively short. I know it's difficult. Let's try to be relatively short in our answers. Ashley and Andy, please. And then we'll go to Joseph's questions and then to Alejandro's question. And let's start with Andy because Andy was didn't speak in the previous round. So let, now let's start with Andy. All right. Thank you, Nikos. Um, First of all, uh, to, to some extent, uh, to a significant extent, that's a question for an economist. And I think, you know, there's a, uh, and I'll give you my answer in just a minute, but the, you know, the free market economists from, from, you know, people like Milton Friedman or Ludwig von, von Mises or Frederick Hayek or Henry Hazlitt, uh, you know, could give you exhaustive answers. Thomas Sowell can give you, you know, very, very, very effective answers uh, regarding the specific uh, of, of economic crisis. But, uh, as a philosopher, let me let me say this: uh, It's A is A. I've already made that point, and capitalism is capitalism. It has a definite nature. Again, uh, you know, Ayn Rand wanted to re re restore the term selfishness. She wanted to she wanted to reinvigorate the term selfishness. That you know, the the conventional meaning is, of course, that you're willing to step all over innocent victims to get whatever you want. And her meaning of the term selfishness is to work hard and honestly in pursuit of, of, of life promoting values and never, you know, pursue those values, achieve those values and never sacrifice those values. I want to restore the term liberalism. It does not mean mixed economy, semi-socialist, welfare state. You know, Bernie Sanders is not a liberal. Uh, Joe Biden's not a liberal. Donald Trump's not a liberal. I'm a liberal the supporter of individual rights. This is the system I'm concerned to uphold and defend. Liberalism, uh, the, the, the term in, in our day is, has come to be capitalism, which I think is, a, is the wrong term. The right term is liberalism. Uh, the protection of individual rights. All right, it doesn't exist in the world today. I have to you know, hammer away at this point. The so-called capitalist countries are at best mixed economy, semi-socialist welfare state. And it's the socialist element of the mixture that always causes the problems. And it's the capitalist element of the mixture that always takes the blame. So for example, I, and again, I'm not an economist, but I, you know, I, I, I'm a dilettante in the field, but you know, I read the free market economist. Thomas Sowell is very good, by the way. Henry Hazel is very good. Uh, Bastiat was outstanding in the 19th century. And, um, uh, the, the housing crisis, uh, 2008 and following in the United States, the, the, the main culprit here was, the, of course, the U.S. government, the Community Reinvestment Act, forcing bankers to make these subprime loans. The banking industry is heavily regulated in the United States, forcing bankers to make the, sub, the subprime loans or else you, 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 the, uh, you know, home ownership was the flavor of the month for welfare status. Everybody have a home, whether you can afford to pay the mortgage or not. You make the loans to high risk people. What would they call them? Uh, ninja loans, right? People with no income, no, no job or assets. You know, you, when you, when you make these, you know, these ninja loans, it's, it's, it's very rational to, to expect they're not going to, the, the very, a, a large number of the people getting these loans, which private bankers would not make because they have to be careful with their deposit is money. Uh, the, unfortunately, a lot, of, a lot of the people getting these loans are unable to, to repay the loans. They go into default, you know, and the, you, you, you see that, you, you see the, the housing bubble, which was created by the government. You see it burst uh, because of its own policies. So that's just one example. I happen to know a little bit of, about that. But again, 
Uh, I want to point out that liberalism uh, was very, we're very close to it in the 19th century or late 19th century in the United States after the repeal, after, after the 13th Amendment repealed slavery, especially in the northern states where there were no Jim Crow laws, where the government brutally initiated coercion against black American citizens. Uh, I think late 19th century America in the northern states was very close to laissez-faire. You read my book, The Capitalist Manifesto, you know, I point out the American historians refer to the age as the Gilded Age, as though, like, borrowing a phrase from Mark Twain, as though there was something corrupt about it. The truth is, it was no more corrupt than anywhere else in the world at, at any point in history, and probably less so. The essence of late 19th century America was that it was, as I called it, the inventive period. It was the, it was the era of Edison and Alexander Graham Bell and the Wright brothers and, you know, and, and John Roebling and the development of, uh, uh, you know, William Bar LeBaron Jenny and Henry Sul Louis Sullivan, the, the, the development of, of skyscrapers and so on and so on. Uh, the development, you know, the automobile industry, the aviation industry, and, and of course, tremendous developments in other fields. You see the great 19th century American writers, you know, whether it's Melville or Twain, or, you know, and, uh, and, 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 and right after them, La Faulkner and Hemingway, and I would say, is, of course, Ayn Rand. Uh, in, in psychology, you see William James pioneer the field of cognitive psychology at Harvard University. It was the freedom of American capitalism. It was the, that liberates the mind. The most brilliant insight Ayn Rand has in Atlas Shrugged is that this, our rational faculty, is man's tool of survival, the same way birds off for, for a wings off a bird, and the mind requires freedom. And it was the freedom of the late 19th century American, close to laissez-faire, that liberated these great thinkers to create wealth that was undreamed of prior uh, to the period. period. The, the solution to our problems and to the creation of superabundance around the world is we need laissez-faire. Let me put it more, more fundamentally in the field of moral philosophy. We need the principle of individual rights upheld, protected by governments around the world. Thanks, Andy. Just to remind the speakers, we have a series of excellent questions, so let's try to be slightly shorter in our answers so that we get to all the questions. Ashley. Okay, um, so you had mentioned that, oh, it's human nature that we have to work on the world, you know, that, uh, that nature's, you know, exerts a certain uh, force on us that we have to be productive. That is true. But the way in which we are productive is different in different epochs. We can use slaves, we can use serfs, we can use human labor, wage labor, we can use robots. <laughs> and the wonderful thing about capitalism is that it, it is replacing a lot of human labor with robots. That is really, really good. That's a fantastic thing for humanity. Except the purpose of replacing human labor with robots is not to benefit humanity, but for the self-expansion of value. Um, and so um, it's, it's not to give us more time to think and create and so on. We work just as much as we always did in spite of the fact that we have uh, a huge amount of automated production because the purpose of automation is not to free people from toil um, but to in in increase surplus value but in that it also creates the basis of a new society so automation is wonderful for human beings but really bad for um uh, but also really bad for human beings within capitalism. Um, and so what we, we are, you can see this, this new basis of, uh, of society where we are need to create, yes, our calories and our certain amount of protein and so on could be created through a fundamentally different mode of production. We could go back to slavery. This time the machines are our slaves. That's perfectly possible. Wouldn't really be capitalism anymore. And long before that happens, we're going to have serious serious problems long before that ever happens we will have huge issues with people getting tossed out of work as they um, get replaced by automation now that's something that's the contradiction there something that is wonderful that could free human beings turns around and starts to control them and starts to act on them uh, as a negative force um, so uh, about creating a system um, like what's my perfect system i don't have a perfect system i'm saying that capitalism is creating something i you can see like through automating production you can see that there's a basis of a new society being created but between now and that future of freedom 
um, where we're free from toil and we are truly, we don't have to sell our labor to a capitalist. We're not thrown about by crisis. We're not forced to send our kid to one school or the other or none at all because we haven't got the money. Um, we have a, a certain level of abundance where these things, yeah, they it would be like the Garden of Eden because if we had things that are produced through like full automation, a factory would become like a tree more or less you just sort of go out and get your thing or you have your 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 robot that digs up the raw materials and so on and this sounds pretty crazy but capitalism is creating that through necessity um through the need to raise profits um and so i'm just saying that there is something that's being created here that has the basis for human freedom but within capitalism creates contradictions a falling rate of profit and and so on and so the very basis of the creation of freedom and abundance is undermined by the thing that creates that abundance and freedom um, and that's why we end up with crises and so on so i don't have a perfect system i'm i i I'm saying that there is a future in which the coercion of scarcity is relegated to the dustbin of history. Um, that I don't know if people will be heroes. I don't know how people will find happiness. I only know that um, the coercion, that uh, the scarcity, the um, yeah, the scarcity, the character, and, and, and fights over resources and so on that characterized all earlier human, human epochs will be ancient history and then we will be truly free to think and create there won't be that separation between what i want to do and what i'm able to do right i want to make music i can make music because i have a i have a house i have food um, that's created by my robot slaves <laughs> Or like, you know, through automation, like we, we've almost fully automated like car factories and things like that. Look at a modern factory. There are very few people in there. It's not so crazy. It's not so far off. Within capitalism, really bad. Um, within some future system, fantastic. I've got my basic needs. I'll make music. I'll, I'll do what I want to do. That's what I want. I have a very, I have an even more negative notion of freedom than you have. I, will, I don't want to stipulate what humans should be. I only want to remove the barriers that I want to figure out how to get past this moment in history and get to that place of freedom on the horizon. Thanks. So we have a question specifically for Andy. Uh, it's, by, it's by Joseph. So he asks, how do concepts and understanding support heroism? What's the role of reason in a hero? So hero is not heroism. Anyway, so the question, I guess, Andy, is how do you get to an objective definition of a of a hero because for example and i have this question actually reading your book and I, I so so someone would say for example where the red army were heroes or 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 someone like a nationalist would say the imperial japan soldiers were heroes and you would say they were not heroes because they were anti-life but the question is how do you objectively by the use of concepts get to an understanding of what heroism is and uh, why we should support heroism. Uh, Dr. Nikos, I'm looking at the questions. What is the role of reason in the hero is the, is the last part. Let me, let me yeah, answer that. It's also what's the, how do concepts and understanding support heroism? Yeah, I'm not sure what that means. Maybe, maybe, maybe what you said is what it means. But anyhow, uh, I, you know, as I, as I, I think Ayn Rand makes clear in her novels and I certainly make clear in my book, uh, Heroes, Legends, Champions, Why Heroism Matters, that um, uh, uh, the good is that which promotes human life. You know, the, the creation of values that promote human life. Like, it's, it's, I think one of these questions in the chat right now is about, you know, the, the pandemic. And so, you, you know, some great medical researcher who develops a vaccine and or a cure for the, you know, for the, the, the disease would be uh, using their rational faculty as a medical researcher to develop some kind of cure treatment that uh, uh, prevents the pre prevents the disease that you know or, or cures it. There's that's a heroic act, and I think uh, the the since reason is is our means of survival, it it, it it follows very logically that this is this is the the main instrument of heroism. I mean, there are certainly heroes. Who, whose most salient trait is physical prowess. Let's say, you know, they're, they're fighting for, for liberty to defend the country they love, the freedom of the country they love, or the family they love, or their, their own freedom. And they're, you know, a very effective warrior. You know, they're an Achilles type, uh, you know, uh, effective war warrior. There are certainly heroes of, of that kind who may be very, very extremely intelligent, 
But you know, the, the the most prominent feature of their heroism is is their martial prowess, their you know, their physical abilities and warfare. Nevertheless, in defending liberty, you know, in defending a free country, the primary thing you're defending is freedom of the mind and the mind's ability. You look at some of the you know the some some of the greatest heroes of history. Uh, we're in a medical uh, stay in a medical context. Louis Pasteur, who was a chemist not a biologist or medical man, but one of the first to develop the germ theory of disease, uh, which, which you know, enabled the development of, of, of any number of medications that saved God knows how many lives. And Pasteur had to stand up against the medical establishment. The scientific sta establishment in the 19th century thought he was a madman, but he stood up for what he knew was right. And in, and, and in, and in so doing, he, you know, he paved the way for uh, tremendous advances in, in the field of medicine. He was a genius. He was a genius in the, you know, in the in the field of science. So I think reason uh, overwhelmingly, although you know, physical prowess is a is a is a great thing uh, in many contexts. Intellectual prowess and uh, is is a much the, the mind is much more powerful than the body, you know, in in this regard. And this is the way this is the fundamental way we promote human life. Although I do not want to denigrate the the heroes. Who, who showed their heroism on the battlefield, you know, for instance, uh, fighting against the National Socialists in World War II, let, let's say, they, they are uh, great heroes, without a doubt. Nevertheless, you know, reason is, is our means of survival. This is the way we, we promote human life, you know, uh, most uh, you know, preeminently. Now, um, was the, you, you, did you say, Nico, your interpretation of, of the other part of the question was how do we define heroism? How do we get an objective definition? No, I think I think you touched about it because you said it's objective because it's it's someone doing that which requires that that kind of what, 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 what promotes human life. Yeah, promotes human life. Yeah. So, next question: How and where can one find heroism, happiness, and meaning? in a coronavirus era. So it's interesting that the premise of the question is that our era is kind of characterized by this. And I think we agree that it's something that we've never seen before. I think more people than ever are gloomy and pessimist and uncertain. So the question is, where do we find the things that we discuss about hero, heroism, happiness, and meaning in these days? OK, well. Uh, yeah, people are pessimistic, and now they have a reason to be pessimistic. <laughs> I think that the it's like the calamity that they were waiting for. It's almost like a sigh of relief. Ah, yes, now here's the the crisis. You know, it's like they, you know, your your paranoia isn't um, alleviated by the fact that your wife is actually cheating on you. You're still paranoiac, right? So I think there's like there's a cultural kind of ethos of survivalism that predates um, coronavirus, which makes for a, a not so great situation because we have, um, we have a, a situation where we absolutely need trust in the masses and trust in dem democracy and the human ability to exercise freedom with responsibility. Um, and this is uh, occurring at a time when we don't have that uh, at an, a historic low in terms of trust in the masses. We have no, a very little sense of political subjectivity. So the masses are just subjects that need to be administered to. Freedom is a problem um, in, in uh, we say this is a bit of my, my own little cliche that when safety is the goal, you know, freedom becomes a problem. So it, you know, this pre-existed coronavirus and it seems like this um, desire to clamp down more and more and more isn't necessarily coming from virology because it, there's a bit of a contradictory stance there because supposedly we're going for herd immunity. But the reason why we have to clamp down is because we can't have mutations but if there are mutations, then we can't have herd immunity. So it's it's very strange, and 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 yet the the desire is more and more clampdowns, more and more lockdowns. Like this is the crisis we were waiting for. This is the reason to remove the freedom we were always so uncertain about. Anyway, I don't know. That's I, I I'm very reluctant to say that kind of thing because it's such a rapidly developing situation. It's very hard to understand what's going on, but I've just been so disturbed by so, how easily progressives have asked for a police state. Now, of course, it may be short term, but there are some of my colleagues that are saying like, oh yeah, happily for a year, that's fine. You know, like <laughs> crash the world economy for like reasons of avoiding uh, a hypothetical risk, put ourselves in direct line of a known uh, of known risks. That seems a bit crazy to me. But I think this pessimism is really important that actually, 
like my understanding of crisis. So I think I actually have more faith in the human subject than even you do, because my understanding of crisis doesn't come from human mistakes. And I think this is the dangerous thing about when you start to understand the economy through human error and human action, like, um, that is human mistakes. So the reason why we have crises is because those people out there just keep doing the wrong thing. Well, when crises keep happening, you just get more and more pessimistic. Like, oh, the system would work. Why won't you just act right? Do the right things. You know, environmentalists are the same. They're like, I keep telling you the world is ending and you keep acting incorrectly. And they get more and more misanthropic, more and more pessimistic because they're not realizing that there is something else that's pushing people to act in particular ways. My understanding of crisis does an, uh, hinge on people making mistakes. In fact, it is people acting rationally. They're very rational actions that in the aggregate level produce something that appears very, very irrational. Thank you, Ashley. Andy, give us something positive in these days. Inspire us. Oh, yeah, absolutely. You know, I do a, a Facebook live show uh, as, as the Brooklyn kid, and one of the personas I bring on is the, the hero guy you know, because I wrote, wrote the book on heroism. And I just did a, a show on this the other night. Uh, one of the great heroes, very, you know, in, in human history, uh, little known, deserves to be far more widely known and very pertinent in, in this situation was Dr. Maurice Hillman, you know, who is the, the, the great vaccinologist that almost nobody has, has, has heard of. But, but Dr. Hillman, who, uh, you know, was was an employee at, at Merck, the, the American pharmaceutical company. Hillman and his team developed eight of the 14 vaccines that are routinely you know, given in the world, say for mumps, measles, chicken pox, hepatitis A, hepatitis B. When, when Dr. Hillman died in 2005, some of his fellow you know, microbiologists and medical researchers eulogized him by saying that his work saved the lives of more human beings than any other uh, biological research of the 20th century. Nice thing, uh, epitaph to have on your on your tombstone. Now there's a hero, uh, somebody who, you know, I don't know what kind, I don't know, there is a biography of him, I haven't read it. Um, I just know his Wikipedia page, to be perfectly honest with you. I don't know what kind of obstacles he overcame to do what he did. I imagine uh, that that there were plenty, but the, the problems that he and his team solved and, and everybody, nobody questions that he was the guy in charge, that it was, he, he was the guiding, he was the guiding genius. So this is what we need today, right? A, a Louis Pasteur, a, a Jonas Salk, who developed the first vaccine for polio, a, a Maurice Hillman, who developed all these vaccines. Somebody at that level of stature, you know, to come up with a vaccine and or a, a, a cure for this disease. And of course, this will flourish best under freedom. And in the United States, I think we need to abolish the FDA. I don't know how many lives the FDA has uh, has has caused, uh, and uh, you know, and 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 liberate. And Maurice Holman happened to you know work for Merck, for a major pharmaceutical company. But remember, Edison did a lot of his work in the 19th century independently. Bell was working independently. The Wright brothers were working in the back of their bicycle shop in Dayton, Ohio. A lot of this work can, you know, can be done independently in private labs, university labs, you know, hospitals, medical research, maybe even some mad scientist's basement, you know, for all I know. But we need uh, individual rights. To, individual rights fundamentally is, is, uh, is, the, is the right of the mind, is, is freedom of the mind. We need to protect the more resilience of the present and, and the future. We can beat this guy. Thank you. So, Amin comments that he would take the crisis of capitalism, assuming they're caused by capitalism, over the mass slaughter and starvation of communism. And he thinks that Marxist anthropomorphize capitalism. And no, no, you you guys are doing that. You guys are doing that. It's not it's not anybody doing anything bad. There's nobody pulling the strings. That's a scary thing. It'll eat us all at the end of the day. Like it's 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 there's nobody behind it. There's there's nothing consciously directing things. It is um, uh, the deep sort of economic structure of society that pushes us in this direction. Let's hope no one's gonna eat us at the end of the day. So two more questions and. Actually, I'll mention both questions. Um, a monster of capitalism. It's the monster. And then you will have your... So you answer these two questions and then you have also your final word if you can incorporate. So Josh asks a technical question. What do you see as the difference between meaning and purpose in life? And then 
Antoine, so what's the difference between meaning and purpose? And then Antoine asks you, and this would be a good way to, to, to kind of leave us on a positive note, he asks, could the speakers name some heroes? Andy has already done so, but Ashley can also do this as well. And what rationale would you use for naming these people our heroes? For example, people are clapping for NHS workers every night because of the work they're putting in around the clock. So let's go with this question, unless anyone has any final thoughts, I mean, from the audience. Andy, difference between, re sorry, difference between meaning and purpose in life? Well, that's an interesting question. I mean, to be perfectly honest with you, I haven't really thought about that. So my answer is just going to come off the, off the top of my head. But I think, of, you know, a purpose is, uh, to, to, to use a synonym, is a, is, is a goal. It's, it's, it's somewhere we want to go. It's something we want to achieve. It's something we want to, we want to reach. So the book I'm writing now on the American educational system, for example, what caused its collapse and, and, and what's the cure? How, how can we resuscitate it? And uh, so, you know, the, the purpose here is to, is to finish, finish writing the book, then sell it to a you know, publisher and go out and promote it, discuss the ideas and uh, the need for, for the focus on more academics in the American schools and less practical skills, which can be taught at home. Uh, there's, a, there's a purpose, it's a, it's a goal, it's some, it's some end that you know, I, I, I strive for. And the, I think the, the purpose here is what adds meaning to my life. The you know, you know, meaning is, 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 is something that you, know, uh, that, that, that you find fulfilling, that you find you know, is, is something that uh, uh, fulfills your purpose. It, 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 it realizes you, it, it, it kind of you know, it, it kind of nurtures and, and supports you. So I find that, that, that fulfillment, that, that nurturing, that, 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 that self-realization uh, in the achievement of the purpose. So I saw so it just off the top of my head. I think, I think there's a, there's a, there's a causal relationship there. I think, you know, uh, achieving one's purposes, both the doing and the uh, getting there adds both of them add meaning to a, a person's life. Thank you. Ashley, you can either touch on that or you can name your heroes and by what standard you claim their heroes. Okay, uh, about the mass slaughter of communism is like, oh, I got nothing else, I'll throw this one out. Um, you know, the standard response to that is, well, you know, everything that socialism did was the fault of socialism, but it, you guys will say that everything that capitalism does is an accident, a human nature, human mistakes. Um, you know, well, you know, there's no point having a, a conversation about death tolls. I think like war and so on is a result of um, underlying drivers within capitalism. Um, it's not just, oops, we had a war, a whole bunch of people died. <laughs> Anyways, um, so heroes today would be um, people who experiment with ideas, who are not afraid to go against the grain and, um, um, and to subvert groupthink. Um, who are willing to test their ideas against others who disagree. I think that's probably the only way that we'll move forward. Our understanding of society has to be tested, first of all, by acting on the world and seeing what happens, um, but also by other people poking holes in our arguments. I know it sucks, it hurts, it's not nice, <laughs> but it's important. Um, my hair, so those are my heroes today. I think about meaning. Uh, meaning has to be um, collective. I think what's happened, and you, you can't have, there, there has to be some kind of shared meaning as well. Um, what's happening now is that we have these sort of endless searches for meaning that are entirely individual, that aren't shared by the wider society, that are about individual identity. And then the quest is to get society to affirm that individual identity. Um, and it's just, uh, it, that becomes an end in itself. And then when it's affirmed, it's not enough. And the identities get smaller and smaller and more and more, you know, minute. Um, and I think that's a product of the fact that we've given up on the idea that there's any kind of future. Our sphere of influence of human beings has shrunk. And so you sort of be the change you want to be in, in the world, you know, you sorry, you want to see in the world. And so it's like any kind of social change you want to have has to be self-contained. And so our quest for meaning, our, um, our projects are entirely individualized and contained within 
you know, one single human being when um, actually we should be looking outward, seeking to convince other people of the goodness, uh, rationality, uh, goodness and rationality of our quest and our project and trying to convince, you know, I think the social change will only happen through a mass movement in society. It can't be through thousands of individuals with their own little individual identities. Right. Thank you, Ashley. I think we definitely should have at some point a discussion on capitalism and what it is so that some of the issues that were mentioned can be addressed because they're on different contexts. I think to, 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 to regarding and to Anne's point on the healthcare system workers, I think even if you don't want the healthcare to be run by the states, I think that the healthcare workers do something which is very difficult. I mean, we are staying at home and we're afraid and they're they are at the hospital, so I think based on Andy's book, they would qualify as doing some heroic deeds uh, these days. So does either one of the speakers want to have a last very short point? Otherwise, I will go to, to Razi for his, uh, what's the opposite of it, outro. So Andy, any very short, I mean, seconds, parting words. I agree with uh, Dr. Foley that uh, social interactions and, you know, and personal relationships are enormously important. You know, friendship, romantic love, family, and, you know, just all the things that we could do for and with each other, Te teaching students, you know, and, you know, and, and, any, any, and social cooperation, Farmer grows the food, the shipper ships at the market, the store owner sells it, you know, and, and so on. But I think all of this uh, rests upon not just political economic freedom or principle of individual rights or you know, liberalism, but it rests more fundamentally on, on a recognition of the sovereignty and of the sacred nature of, uh, of an individual, uh, of, of an individual pursuing his or her own values for his or her own fulfillment cooperating with any number of other people uh, peacefully, rationally. We banned the initiation of force. Uh, and of course, having you know, close personal relationships, which is an enormous source of fulfillment in, in, in people's life. But I think we need to respect the individual value hierarchy of each person. I'm going to con conclude with this. I think you know, the, the best thing we can do for our brothers and sisters, assuming they're honest people, is uh, understand what their value hierarchy is and then act in support of their values. A simple example would be gift giving. Did you ever get a Christmas present or a birthday gift that was completely alien to you and you say, and you like you want to pull your hair and say, what, what were you thinking? You know, and, and they say it's it's the thought that counts. Well, exactly right. When you put some thought into it, what that means is you identify the values of the person to whom you're giving the gift and give the gift in accordance with that person's values. Not the, not the thing that you think they should have or not the thing that society thinks they should have or the family thinks they should have, but the gift that's in accordance with the person's values. And that's, uh, that's goodwill. And it, it, across the board, if I'm, if I'm going to help out my brothers and sisters, the best thing I could do for them is know what their values are and then act in accordance with them. I have a friend, for example, who's an you know, aerospace engineer. He's, he's not a writer. He's writing an essay on, on school invasions. Uh, he asked me to help him with it. So here, this is, this is important to him now. He's moving into the field of writing. I have expertise in this area. I act in support of his, of, of his values. And this is goodwill. This is kindness. And it's, it's a form of egoism. It's recognizing the person's, what the person's values are and helping, uh, helping them achieve those values. So I think, you know, again, the sovereignty of the individual value hierarchy, I think uh, uh, it's interesting, isn't it? That goodwill and benevolence and kindness is actually, uh, it actually logically rests upon egoism, meaning egoism, meaning you know, pursuit of one's self-interest. And here you're, you're identifying somebody's values and helping them uh, self-actualize, helping them achieve their values. It's interesting. Benevolence rests upon goodwill. I'm gonna. Uh, I mean, I mean, benevolence rests upon a certain form of egoism, rational, not cynical egoism. I'm gonna write an essay on that one day. Good, and I I can't wait for all this thing to be over and some hero. Not not the event. <laughs> I mean, the coronavirus finding some heroes to rise up and help us get over it because we're gonna have Ashley and Andy in a real kind of physical space event because there's so many things left today 
to discuss. So, so wait, I, do I get to say something? <laughs> Yeah, but it has to be seconds. Okay. Uh, all right. I agree with you that human beings always have uh, choices, but cho choices operate within confines, and those confines are conditioned by the economic structures, the way that we work on the world, the way that we make the things that we need to survive. So, for example, Greeks um, would submit readily to fate. You know, even the gods were subject to fate because in their world, they really were subject to fate. They had this sense of having free will at the same time as they were thrown about by forces beyond their control, earthquakes, you know, um, um, natural disasters, um, blights, all of that sort of thing characterized the ancient world. And so they readily accepted and submitted to fate. We won't do that now. Um, we're less willing to accept that because we have an inkling that our free will is actually capable of being exercised meaningfully in the world. Um, but we are not fully free. Um, I agree with you that nothing is sacred, but between capitalism and freedom, I'll always choose freedom. Okay, so thank you, Ashley. So, Razi. Nikos, you mentioned at the beginning the uh, debate last year between uh, Jordan Peterson and Slavoj Žižek. The title of that was uh, Happiness, Capitalism versus Marxism. And I didn't make it through the whole thing, but from what I watched, the, uh, the supposed defender of capitalism didn't really defend capitalism. The supposed defender of Marxism didn't defend Marxism. Mm -hmm. And both of them uh, denied that happiness was even a possibility. So I think uh, our speakers today did a better job in debating that topic than um, two of the most highly regarded intellectuals uh, in the world today. And hopefully, I'm not sure we'll get as many views on YouTube, uh, but we should, and we should get more. And uh, once we can do live events again, as Nikos mentioned, uh, we hopefully will do this event live, and I know Andy and uh, Ashley will both um, be speaking at several of our events. We were planning to launch weekly panel discussions this week, uh, and we will launch them when we can. Um, so yeah, our next event, just a reminder, is this Wednesday. I forgot to mention the time. It's going to be 9 p.m. Uh, usually we're at 7 p.m. This one will be at 9 because uh, Gloria Alvarez is in Australia. So. Uh, We'll, we'll start it at nine uh, and we'll run for about two hours. And uh, yeah, as I said, every Monday, Wednesday and Saturday, I hope you'll all join us and uh, thank you for joining us today.